repertory him this morning. What a day that will be. Amen.
Um, as you know, we have many missionaries we support. Most of them send us letters, and we get those newsletters. Sometimes I read them, sometimes I don't. But we hear from our missionaries. But this time they sent me a video, and you guys have met them. If you were here when I came here, um, they, they, uh, I invited them because they were already friends of mine. They were about to go to Kenya. And now that they're there, they, they, again, they send stuff all the time. It's the first time they've ever sent me a video. So I hope if you met them, you'll remember the McDonald family, Corey and Elizabeth and their children. And for a long time, there was a race to who could have the most kids, and I'm telling you, they won. <laughs> they have six, so they win. except for the baby, and I have them written down, but I can't remember. I can barely remember my kids' names. So. <laughs> Anyhow, um, how many of you remember meeting the McDonald family right here? Praise God. Praise God. My idea, and, and I'm not picking on people who don't, I'm just saying my idea of a missionary for the Lord is somebody who goes, takes their family, and invests time and energy, sweat, blood, and tears into where they're going. And they have been there since they went there in 19. They've not been back yet. Now, mm -hmm. they plan to visit on occasion. But they made they got their citizenship there. That's home. Their kids, the last one was born there. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a commitment. I thought I made a commitment when I moved to Delhi, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. But nothing to near the same as what they've done. And they're doing it for God. So they're anyway, I want to... Want... Well, they've... Uh, they blessed me, so I wanted to share that with you. All right, I got to get into this. Tim said I have to hurry because we got to eat. So. <laughs> got black what I'm talking about. It. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get at it. Okay, <laughs> Philippians chapter two and verse five. The Bible says, <clears throat> "Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant." and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion, as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you for being our God. 
Thank you for this church. Thank you for those who are faithful to turn aside to be here today to hear your word preached and to praise you and sing praises unto you and to honor you, Lord, with their presence. Lord, we're here to meet with you. We're here to receive from you, Lord. If, if, if you would just open our hearts to receive it and teach us from your word today, Lord, let your message just fill us and strengthen us and guide us as we try to serve you, Lord. And help me today as I try to preach. I need you, Lord. I can't do it without you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you're wondering why I'm talking louder, my son didn't give me my lapel mic, and the camera got moved back there. When it was here, you could hear it on YouTube. If I don't speak loud and clear, you can try to watch it on YouTube. You can't hear me. Not that I'm that important, but I'm not yelling at you. I'm trying to make sure that thing can hear me, okay? Nobody's mad. All right. Amen. If I said to you, we were going to have a testimonial service, how many of you would raise your hands knowing what I'm talking about? Let me see a show of hands. You know what a testimonial service is. Praise God. If there's time, we're going to do that at the end. But before we do, I want to share with you why, okay? Looking at our text, real quickly, I want to show you what Paul had to say. And by the way, if you're A-type personality, I'm going to help you out. We're going to start here. We're going to go to Acts chapter 9 and read the first 22 verses. Then we're going to go to Acts 22 and read the first 22 verses. Then we're going to go to Acts 26 and read the first 22 verses. So, to review, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, and then we're going to close in Philippians 3. And I know what you're thinking. Brother Chad, that's a whole lot of scripture. Now you know why I'm in a hurry. Okay. <clears throat> Fortunately for you, a lot of it says the same stuff. So you're going to follow this just fine. Okay? Everybody with me? Yes. Amen. All right. The Bible says in Philippians 2 and verse 5, and I know I read it, but I want to share this with you. This is Paul talking, and he says, let this mind be in you. In other words, this is the mindset you should have Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, if you are born again, redeemed, saved of Almighty God, this is the mind you should have. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, you're not better than Jesus if this is the mindset Jesus had. And you, bless you. If, you. if this is the mindset Jesus had and you claim to be a Christian, you are like Christ, then this should be the mind you have. Okay? That's what he's saying. Verse 6. And then he goes on to say, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he is God. But what did he do? Having the authority to say, I am Almighty God, he did not do that. He made himself of no reputation. How many times do we as people, as Americans, as human beings, worry about our reputation? How many times as human beings do we want to have a good reputation? We want to be prestigious. We want to have things and be known. Oh, I know who that is. Ooh, they got a good name. That's a good man. That's a good woman. And hey, there's nothing wrong with a good reputation. But what did Jesus do? You know, when they hung him on the cross, they did it in such a fashion that he was remembered by history as a criminal. We don't remember him that way because he's our Savior. But history has him listed as a criminal that was worthy of death. And they shamed him by stripping him and beating him and hanging him up there for all the world to see. They publicly humiliated him. Was he worried about his reputation? No. Should we be worried about ours? I spent a lot of my life worried about the wrong things. Paul says, <clears throat> made himself of no reputation, verse 7, took on him the form of a servant. What's wrong with Americans today is we've forgotten how to serve. We've forgotten how to put others first. We've forgotten how to love with our heart. If it ain't about me, it ain't important. That's just unfortunately the way that we are. And we even write songs about it. I am not. And we'll never be a Toby Keith fan. But Mike Barker used to tease me. He, there, and in fact, and, and this is one of the things about Facebook I love. <clears throat> It'll show you a memory from the past. And I got a memory this past week where Mike Barker shared a post with Toby Keith. He said, here's your favorite singer. What I don't like about him is the types of songs he writes. It's all about me. It's all about I. All about not one oh my. No, it ain't. I was listening to some podcast this week that I wish I hadn't. This person was talking about believing in yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. And that's the worst thing you can do. You've got to put your faith in God. You have no power in and of yourself. 
and make yourself like Jesus who made himself like a servant. What I love about this church is I've seen every one of you, one form or another, one time or another, serve somebody beside yourself. Help somebody beside yourself. I didn't bring any food back there. And you guys will still let me go back there and eat. Because you have a heart of service and you care enough about me to make sure I get to eat too, even though I didn't contribute anything. And listen, you don't want me to. I can't cook, okay? <laughs> When I got married, I was tired of being too thin. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself. The God of all creation doesn't have to ever humble himself. He can exalt himself and say, I'm God, and you're going to do what I say. But he did it. He humbled himself. Why? Why? Because he loved you and he loved me and we were trapped in our sins. Mm -hmm. and praise God. He humbled himself and he did it as an example to us. And because he humbled himself, God exalted him. Let me tell you something else. If you will humble yourself, God will exalt you. <coughs> you say, well, that ain't why I do it. Good. <coughs> That's not why we do it. But just know, if you'll humble yourself, Serve others and serve God and love with all your heart. God will someday exalt you. God will reward you. God will give you crowns and jewels in those crowns. And that's where we read in the Bible that they cast their crowns at His feet because they recognize, I have this crown and I got this reward, but I only got it because of you. Because not only what you did for me, but the example you gave me in what I should do. Jesus gives the power to do it, and He gives us the example to do it. That's what Paul's talking about here. And then, there at the end of that passage I read, it talks about that exaltation, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now listen. I could go on. This whole letter to the Philippians is good. I mean, it's hard to stop anywhere, but I want to stop there and I want to share something with you, okay? The Apostle Paul was a great guy, but you know he wasn't always that way? Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the testimony of Paul. I want you to see where he gave the same testimony three times in Scripture, and probably more than that that's not recorded. Paul gave his testimony a lot. I've been here in three and a half years. We've never had a testimonial service. When I was growing up, we did it at least once a year. And we're going to try to end with one. But without further ado, turn to Acts chapter 9. Most of you know this, but for maybe somebody here who doesn't, maybe somebody here who's never read it, I want to be very thorough and very clear, okay? The Apostle Paul was born Saul. His name was Saul. Probably named after King Saul. They were both from the tribe of Benjamin. You know how we name people after people today? It's very likely that Saul, that became the Apostle Paul, was named after King Saul. They were both from the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin was a very prestigious tribe. Does anybody know why? Because Benjamin was the favorite son when they thought Joseph was dead. The name Benjamin means son of my right hand. When you see B-E-N in, in, in English, typically if you're referencing Hebrew, um, it, it is a reference to a son. But anyway, I, I don't want to get into that at the moment. It's not important. But he was from the tribe of Benjamin. It was a pre very prestigious tribe that was considered the favorite because of it being Rachel's son. Acts 9, verse 1. The Bible says, And Saul, this is the Apostle Paul before he changed his name, breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Underline that word. Slaughter. Y'all know what a slaughter is? Means he wasn't just punishing people. He wasn't just killing them. He was slaughtering them. I didn't write it, y'all. Threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue. Now, don't miss this. It wasn't enough that they run the church pretty much out of Jerusalem after Jesus died. After Jesus was crucified, the priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees wanted that Christianity gone. And so they persecuted the church to the point they thought they had them all either locked up, dead, or on the run. And they were. That's why the gospel left Jerusalem. 
But it wasn't good enough that we got them out of Jerusalem. It wasn't good enough that we got them out of Galilee. It wasn't good enough that we've run them plumb out of Israel. Now we got to go to Syria and get them because I don't want them all gone. He asked for letters to go to Damascus, Syria. It's not even in Israel. What business does Paul have chasing Christians plumb to Syria? But that's the kind of hate that he had for God's people. That's the kind of hate Satan has for Jesus. Just to get you the perspective we're looking at. Okay? <clears throat> he desired letters to go to Damascus to the synagogues. And if he found any of this way, underline that, this way. This way is talking about Christianity. Whether they were men or women. He didn't care. If it was men, women, or children, he wanted them dead. Slaughtered. He might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. First, he wanted to make a public mockery of them in Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? Let me tell you why he said, Who out there, Lord? He didn't know him. He was one of the most religious people that had ever lived. We're going to see that later as we study this. He was a religious guy. He kept the law. He was a Pharisee. He did everything he thought was right, everything he'd ever been taught by godly religious parents. He had done everything as far as he knew that honored God. In his mind, he was serving God. But he didn't know the Savior. Who are you, Lord? That's what he said. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, remember that name, above all names, whom thou persecutest, it's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight. Neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. See, the Lord knows what things we have need of before we ask him. He knows what things you're going to pray about before you pray them. And God knew he was going to be praying for his sight and he made sure there'd be a man there just on time to use to bring him his sight. Verse 13, and Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. You know what Ananias is saying? Lord, you know who you're talking about? That's a bad guy. That guy hates us, Lord. That guy wants us dead. That guy wants to arrest us and drag us back to Jerusalem and put us on display. I've heard about the evil that he's done, Lord. Let this be a lesson to you, Christian. It could be anybody. Anybody. They come to know Jesus. They're not the same person anymore. That's why I try not to lose hope for anyone, no matter how weak they might be. And I said, Lord, I've heard of this guy. Verse 14, there he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that calls on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, do you have any idea how hard that had to be? Think about somebody who hated you, who wished nothing but evil upon you. And the Lord said, Hey, go lay your hands on him. He's your brother now. Ooh, wouldn't that be hard to do? Well, we've been studying forgiveness in Sunday school. And I was thinking about how hard it had to be for J. Joseph to look on them brothers after all they'd done to him, after everything they had inflicted upon him, for him to look at them 
and be able to just completely forget it and forgive and just love them anyway. That's one of the hardest things there ever has been to do. Well, Ananias did it. He put his hands on him and he called him his brother. He says, Jesus that appeared to you as thou camest, he sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received me, he was strengthened. And then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. I want you to notice he wasn't baptized until this time, until he had accepted Christ, received the Holy Spirit, then he got baptized. There's no point in baptizing one as a baby. I don't know why anybody ever started that. That's not in Scripture nowhere. You don't find anywhere where they baptize babies. If you can find that Scripture, please show it to me. Later, not now. Okay. <clears throat> You won't find it anyway. He says, uh, verse 19 says, he was strengthened by spending certain days with the disciples. You know, after you get saved, you've got to be around some Christians. You've got to be around some disciples. As Brother Mark said this morning, iron sharpeneth iron. You cannot strengthen yourself. People say, well, I can serve God at home. I can start a Bible study and just serve God at home. Well, you can if you'll surround yourself with Christians. <coughs> because iron sharpeneth iron. But if you don't surround yourself with Christians, who's sharpening who? There's a reason he tells us to go to church. I didn't write that either. It's in there. Okay. He says in verse 21, but all that heard him were amazed. Right? I think I skipped a verse. Verse 20 says straightway. I love that. After he gets saved, spends a little time with some disciples, about the straight way. He started preaching Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Straightway, he didn't waste no time. The man got saved, and then he started telling others how they could be saved. Do you see how quickly that transpired? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you've got to go to Bible college first, and then you can share your witness. That's not in there nowhere. You get saved, you immediately have a testimony. <clears throat> Amen, right there. When you get saved, your sins are washed away immediately you have a testimony. You say, I don't know about the Scripture. You know your sins were washed away. You know who washed them away. You've got a testimony. Okay? We'll come back to that. It says, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he be the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them? That's another <laughs> strong word. He destroyed them, which called on this name. This name is Christ's name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent. That's what he came here for. That he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus proving that this is very Christ. And after many days, the Jews took uh, counsel to kill him. Turn to Acts 22. So, in Acts 9 we read how Paul got saved in Acts 22, he recounts the story because he loved to give his testimony. Listen to me. When Jesus saves you from all your sins, and imagine your sins are as bad as Paul's. Paul had persecuted the church of God. Paul had seen people arrested and hauled off to prison, killed, and was even holding coats when they slaughtered Stephen. He had been involved in a variety of ways in the murder of people who love Jesus. But when he got saved, y'all, he got saved and all those sins were forgiven. I don't care what you've done. If God can forgive the Apostle Paul, He can forgive you. Acts 22, verse 1. Or actually, I'll start back one verse. Chapter 21, verse 40. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue. Now listen, he had just gotten arrested at Jerusalem. We're not going to read it. You can go back and read it. But they were beating him. They were beating him. In fact, when the, uh, when the centurion showed up, the Bible says they left beating of him. They beat on him until the laws got there. That's what happened. It'd be like today if the cops rolled up and you were still whooping on somebody and you only stopped because the cops rolled up. That's what happened according to Acts chapter 21. And I'd love to study that, but for time's sake, we're going to move on. And so he says these words, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now to you. And when they heard that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, they kept more silence. And he said, I'm a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God, 
as you all are this day. He identifies with them. By the way, when you're witness, witnessing to somebody, you've got to be able to identify with them. Why would they listen to you if you don't? You've got to be able to identify with them. You've got to be able to say, I was a sinner too. I was right where you're at. And he tells them, he says, I was just like you guys. I loved God and I was zealous toward God and I was trying to do what I thought was right. Verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons men and women. Also, high priest doth bear me witness, meaning that guy knows I'm telling the truth. And all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus, about noon suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now some of you are going to say, Chad, why you read this? We just read this. I'll read it quickly, but you need to know he shared his testimony with them. That's what we're supposed to do. He says, and I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, and thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spoke to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, Arise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them which were with me, I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came to me, stood, and said to me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, that's Jesus, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness to all men of what thou hast seen and heard. That word witness is important. Pay attention to that. Verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive that testimony concerning me. Now he's talking to Jerusalem when he says that. He says, the Lord told me to get out of here. They're not going to hear me. But I had to tell you my testimony. Let me tell you something. Sometimes when you share your testimony, they're not going to hear it. Okay? You still got to share it. Verse 19 says, And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beaten every synagogue that they believed on me. He's arguing with God. God said, get out of there. I'm not going to listen to you. He's arguing with God. But Lord, they know who I am. They're the ones that sent me to Damascus. They remember me. They remember what I did for them. They'll understand. You ever argue with God? Paul did too. I don't believe he was ever supposed to be in Jerusalem, but we're not going to cover that today. He says, <clears throat> verse uh, 20, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment, that means clothes, of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Jesus told him, Go, and he didn't. <coughs> now watch this, verse 22. <coughs> and they gave him audience until this word. What word? Gentiles. That made them mad. They didn't want to hear that. They lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. It's not fit that he should live. And they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air. They threw a big wall-eyed fit. They were listening to him when he was giving his testimony, but when he mentioned the Gentiles, they said, kill him! I don't want to hear no more. Acts 26. One more time, Paul gives his testimony. And I would submit to you, he did it all the time. But we're giving it three times in Scripture. Now, does that seem redundant to you? Because I believe God had a reason for giving it to us three times in Scripture. Acts 26 and verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, now just to catch you up, he's been moved to Caesarea. He's still in jail. It's been a couple years. King Agrippa comes because he's curious. He wants to hear what Paul has to say. And Agrippa's not a Jew, but he's king of the Jews. He's actually an Edomite. But he knew the law, okay? They're brothers to the Jews. It says, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And any time Paul was permitted to speak for himself, he would give his testimony, which is an example to you, Christian. He says, Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee. Touching all things whereof I am accused by the Jews, especially because I know you're an expert in all the customs and the questions that are among the Jews, wherefore... I beseech thee, hear me patiently. He says, I know you know this stuff. Listen to me, please. 
my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived as a Pharisee, and now I stand and I'm judged for the hope of the promise made of God under our fathers, under which promise our twelve tribes instantly, serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? That's a good question. Why should that seem incredible that God could raise the dead? It shouldn't. God can do anything. <clears throat> that was what they had a problem with, with him saying Jesus had resurrected. Verse 9, Verily I, taught, I thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. And I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under strange cities. He says, I wasn't happy to persecute them at home in Israel. I followed them plumb to other cities. And we knew that. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and then was journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise, stand upon my feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, there's that word again, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But first I showed them at Damascus and then at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me, having therefore obtained help of God. I continue unto this day witnessing to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, he should be the first, that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Now, I don't want to get into what happened next. They thought he was crazy. They didn't hear his testimony. But the point is, he gave it. Turn with me now back to Philippians chapter 3, please, and we will finish the passage, and then I'm going to share couple of personal things and then we're going to have a short testimonial service and we're through. Philippians chapter 3. There's a whole lot to this and I wish I had more time but I'm going to ask you to study these passages yourself. See what God says to you out of this. But I want you to know that Philippi is in Macedonia and Paul who had given his testimony everywhere he had gone now writes it in a shorter version to Philippi. This letter to the Philippians says a lot, but I want to start in chapter 3, verse 4, where he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. That's a way of Paul saying, look, you can't trust in your flesh. You can't trust in your body. But if you could, compare yours to mine. So everybody sitting here today, compare with me. If you could be saved by your works and by the law, compare you to Paul on what he's about to say. Verse 5. I was circumcised on eight days. By the way, there's seven of these. There's seven things he gives you here about why he's better than you. Okay? I'm going to show you all seven. Circumcised on eighth day. There's one. Of the stock of Israel. There's two. Not everybody circumcised is of the stock of Israel. But he was. Of the tribe of Benjamin. There's three. Benjamin was the favored tribe. A Hebrew of Hebrews. There's four. I don't have time to develop that point. As touching the law, a Pharisee. There's five. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He says, I was so zealous, 
I persecuted the church. There's six. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Number seven. Doesn't mean he was perfect, but it means anytime he messed up, he would follow the law for redemption. He would go and get a sacrifice to cover his sin. So he'd be blameless before the people. So Paul says, beat that. There's seven reasons why I'm better than you if we're going by how good you are. What does he say next? But what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. He says, throw all seven of them away. They're worthless. Then he says in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Here's what he's saying. I was a Pharisee. I'm not anymore. I was the golden child of all of Israel. I'm not anymore. I had power. I had prestige. I had money. And I had family. I lost it all. And it's done to me. It means nothing. Because Jesus is all that matters. Remember how we started this? Jesus humbled himself. Jesus came as a servant. Jesus showed us that we're supposed to humble ourselves and be willing to serve. And then we're given this testimony. And then Paul tells us that we put too much stock in things that don't matter. And we need to consider them dumb. Verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here's what Paul is saying. You have a testimony. Use it. We're not going to be long, but I want to share mine. I'm going to give you an opportunity to share yours. And I would to God that everybody here was willing to, but you don't have to. You don't have to say a word, but I'm going to give you a moment. Let me share with you mine. When I was five years old, my parents divorced, and I went to live with my daddy. While I lived with my daddy, I was raped several times. Not by my dad, but by a stepbrother. I was raped several times. I was beaten at one point. He, this boy beat me so bad, I broke my left finger. My left leg was broken, and I was put in crutches. I was abused in ways I don't even want to describe. I suffered, and I believe now, looking back, the devil was trying to kill me. Because he knew someday God was going to use me for something. I was seven years old, 1986, when a neighbor, a lady whose name I didn't even know, told me about Jesus and told me that he loved me, and I didn't know what love was. I had wondered, I had cried out. I begged somebody to hear me, but I didn't know who to ask. I didn't know who to talk to. I couldn't go to my daddy. I was scared. This dear lady next door, whose name I don't even know, told me about Jesus. Told me that not only would He save me in a very physical way, but more importantly, He would save me spiritually. He would take all my sins away. And you got me thinking, what sins does a seven-year-old have? I guarantee you I had some. I wouldn't. I needed saving in every way a person could need saving. I needed my sins washed away and I needed my situation changed. I needed the Lord and I had no idea about it. But I knelt down and I cried and I prayed and I asked Jesus to save me and He did. And it wasn't long after that, the laws found me, put me back with my mama, prosecuted that fellow, I don't know where he's at, don't care. Grew me over time, developed me, showed me the Word of God, taught it to me, <clears throat> made me into the man I've become, and has walked with me ever since through everything I've ever been in. And He changed me. I'm nowhere near where I used to be. And the person you see before you today is made out of the same dirt you're made out of, but for the grace of God. I am saved forevermore. Those songs, Brother Gary picked about the role being called up yonder, hey, I'll be there. And if you know you'll be there and you want to share your testimony, I would ask you to stand and do that now. You don't have to, but if somebody got something they want to say about Jesus, here's your opportunity. Go ahead. Come on. You already stood? Uh, 
I was 36 years old, grew up Catholic, the Catholic school, <coughs> you know, trying to find the answers. Marine Corps, drugs, drinking. I was a bodyguard, bouncer, uh, biker, you know, uh, bodyguard of drug dealers, did all kinds of things. And, and then guys were hunting me down to kill me. Did, you know, all that thing went on. So I was just thinking, saying, man, there's got to be an easier way to doing all this stuff. So one day I woke up, put my leathers on, and went to a church from these other people I knew. I said, well, those people are Jesus freaks. But I said, wow, maybe they might have the answer. Went to the church, walked in, a big old boy preacher, Portuguese fellow. He preached Jesus Christ crucified. And I could, and he said that I could be forgiven of all my sins. And <coughs> so that day I said, wow, and this is free? And I could be forgiven? I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do it. So I did it that day. Then from that day, you know, God delivered me of the drugs, the drinking. I, I, I took all the different sized guns I had and I replaced them with Bibles the same size as those guns. <laughs> so then because I had to replace the guns with something, so I replaced it with the Word of God, you know, and then my journey began and I just, every time the church was open I went and, and just kept going and kept going and, and here we are, that was 19, 1994, I was 36 years old. So God's been good ever since. Amen. So, like Chad, I was uh, raised in a broken home. My parents divorced when I was seven. And at seven, I had to make a decision who I was going to go with. And that was the first time I remember God speaking to my heart. I wasn't a Christian at the time, but you know, he told me I needed to go with my dad, and I did. And I didn't see my mother again for about ten years. But the lady that he ended up marrying was a very mean, hard-hearted woman. And I lived the next eight to ten years with a stepmother that uh, I thought hated my guts. And it was, it, there was no love in the home whatsoever. Uh, when we were, four, when I was 14, we moved to Surfside, Texas. And the Baptist church there had an RA program, which is called Royal Ambassadors. <coughs> So I started going to that because they hunted and they fished and they played baseball and basketball. And every time they do that, they'd have an invitation. Well, I'd live with the invitations. I'd put up with that just so I could go hunt and fishing with us. <laughs> so every invitation, I could feel that same God knocking on the door of my heart. And I just kept pushing him away. You know, it's not, not now. I'm 14 years old. You know, I've got my whole life to live ahead of me. I don't want to do this right now. So that went on for two years, and every time I could, every time there was an invitation at the end of a campfire service or a hunting trip or a baseball game, I could feel my Creator knocking on the door of my heart. When I was 16, we were going to move away from there, and the church gave us gave me a going away party, and it was a surprise. I had no idea this was going to happen. So that night, 10 o'clock at night, after the the Wednesday night church service and the, this going away party they gave me. I was walking down 10th Avenue, which is no longer 10th Avenue of Surfside. They've renamed all the streets. <clears throat> Just me walking down this avenue, and I felt God knocking again on the door of my heart. I knew who it was. It was my Creator calling out to me. But it was different this time. I felt like if I didn't respond this time, I'd not get another chance. And that's something we all need to be aware of. God's not going to knock on the door of your heart forever. The door is always open. There's going to come a point in your time when you've hardened your heart so much that you will not open your heart to God. So I asked him into my heart in between 10th and 11th Street on Surfside. <laughs> and for the next two weeks, I don't think my feet ever touched the ground. Hey. You know, the first time in my life, I felt loved. I felt complete. I felt whole. I was who God intended me to be. And now, 45 years later, this is 1973. I was baptized out in the Gulf of Mexico in December and about froze to death. Um, you know, 40 some odd years later, and when times get hard and they get tough, I remember 
that two week honeymoon I had with my God. And I look forward to the day when I'll be able to do that with Him for eternity. Amen. 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 Anyone else want to share this? All right, so, <laughs> pretty new here. Uh, thanks to Brother Mark and Sister Jan. Set back here, it's kind of really helped me out along with some of y'all. Yeah, I see y'all. Uh, well, kind of Mark I used to be pretty wild. I mean, I was tighter from the word go from I think about the five to thirteen or five to eighteen and did karate compete all around the country for I was very good at it. And I took that ego with me out on the road, out on the streets and you know, before we moved down here, the same I mean, I used to ride with Hell's Angels. I rode with several motorcycle groups, and I was a member just having fun, raising 10 ton of hell. I mean, that's what we raised. I mean, drinking drugs, 100 mile an hour down the road with a whiskey bottle in your pocket, drinking it as you go, smoking joints. All kinds of fun at the time, uh, until one day I kind of realized, you know, it wasn't as much fun as I thought it was. One woke up, bike still sitting in the living room of my house, my apartment at the time. I woke up, stuff I had drunk, and looked there and said, whoa, what did I do? And my wife says, uh, you know, you rode it through the door last night. So that was kind of the start to my, hey, I need to slow down a little bit. Well, next few years, we just kind of slowed down, but it's still going pretty hard, doing no stupidity. Well, then she left, and I've been raising my two youngest for the last four years on my own. I had to slow down then because, well, they got partying with their kids with me. They still, pretty hardly, they probably never seen under 100 mile an hour unless it was 15 years, you know, to get off the road, like, uh, flying down their roads, drinking beers, having fun, you know, raising hell with my buddies. Still doing wild, but not as wild stuff. Some stuff happened, I met a woman, and uh, long story short, I ended up in Texas, in the great state of Kentucky. We moved down here, and uh, oh, I hated it for the first few weeks, because I knew nobody, and it's, it's pretty dang different down here. And I was still smoking joints, and drinking bourbon, and having a good time, so I was here. Well, I just walked in this little leather shop one day, and uh, met these two fine folks, Mr. Dan and Mr. Mark, and then Mark's kind of, you know, he, he's a Yankee, but yeah. I've heard that song, Dan Yankees, Dan Yankees, you know, I look up to one. And, uh, you know, Brother Mark here, and Mr. Dan has been really like our only family until we met all y'all down here. And uh, our lives have really done a 360 over the past couple months, well, been here six almost seven months so it's been a culture shock it's been a shock at every level but uh you know for this old farm kid from kentucky raising hell fighting drinking having a good old time to come down here to texas to not know anybody to start to meet good people to get, kind of keep me away from all that stuff and uh honestly i feel better in my life than i ever have and uh, i'll be uh, 39 this year. So uh, it's been a real neat journey with you guys that has welcomed me you know, to <coughs> your church and lives. And uh, we appreciate it. And we couldn't have done any of that throughout. God, you know, tell me, as I passed by here a couple times, stop. You know, we went to another church. Something kept us busy every Sunday. Something would come up where we couldn't go. But then, we came here and nothing has came up. Every Sunday has been pretty and clear. We've been here and uh, like we really feel at home. I love it. You got saved. I got saved right there on that, that bench here. And, uh, and uh, we love it here. And I can't wait till uh, I'm going to break the barrier and get baptized here and with you all. And I think it will be a pretty good thing. And you know, I'm trying to drag these two with me. Uh, and they did, especially this time in their life, I mean, it's, this generation is wild. And uh, these kids, all of these kids in this world need God badly. 
and they need more people to step forward and, and help us. So I like to thank y'all for helping me and help y'all. That's it. Tim, I'm not going to make your stomach growl long. <laughs> <laughs> My story is somewhat different than these. My trials and tribulations didn't come when I was young. I grew up, thank goodness, in a Christian family. Generations of I was saved and baptized when I was nine years old, First Baptist Church in Sydney, Texas. I didn't, I, I led for the time of pretty normal teenage years. I ran around and drank, not to excess, but there was always something. And this was after I'd been saved. There was always something in there. You ain't supposed to be doing this. You're not supposed to be doing this. And there was instilled in me the biggest thing, and I wondered when I became a father, how do I make my kids think this? The biggest deterrent was I didn't want to embarrass my parents. I've done things I'm not proud of, like we all have. But the whole time, I mean, I've been a Christian. I've drifted away. I didn't take my kids to church like I was taking. And I feel guilty about that. I'm trying to make up for it now. But I've always felt like, and I still today, and Chad and I have talked about it, I'm supposed to be doing something. There's something I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm still searching for that. So I'd ask for your prayers that that be revealed to me. I've been given a gift, and my wife sometimes says it's not a gift, but I can talk. <laughs> and that makes me think that that's got something to do with what I'm supposed to be doing. But thank God for Christian prayers. And I reference, I did it today. This is my mother's Bible. One of many. And we'll go through these lessons. And Chad will ask for a question about something. And lo and behold, my <laughs> old mind is written in the sides in Mother's Bible. Uh, I think that's, that's not by accident. No. No. We found a home here. I wish I'd get my kids to come here, and I'm working on that. But God's got a plan. And if you'll seek it, He'll show you. I know there's food back there. I know y'all are hungry. I don't want to keep you a long time, but I want to say this is important. If you've got a testimony you want to share, I'll make the time if you will. If not, I understand. Is there anybody? I'll make them up. Gary, go ahead. Okay. I've been a member of this church all my life. And my sister and I were blessed that my mother came to, after we were born, she came to know the Lord. And she was so faithful. We came to church everywhere we went. If we went somewhere, we went to San Antonio a lot because my grandparents lived there. We had to go to Sunday school. And I was at some I was at some church there, and those kids were so they were so mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a kid, I just didn't know why they were. You know. But we went, I and mean, we I, we. You remember that church there on South Crescent? The church, I got worse. I was praying for <laughs> But, uh, yes, my mother came to know the Lord. We just, we didn't miss Sunday school. Wherever we were, we had to go to Sunday school. And, uh, I remember when our church burnt and watched it burn to the ground. It was just, you know, we just sort of, as a, but the Lord helped us. We rebuilt this building. And I see as the days go by that we're getting too big for this building. <laughs> I'm hoping and hoping that someday the Lord allows us to build a new building between the sparshes this year. Hopefully it will be needed. But the most important thing, I met my wife here. And she's been such a blessing to my life and her family. And uh, I'm so blessed to see 
our church family growing. The Lord is working here. And uh, we just still want to be able to serve in here. And, and hopefully we'll have the freedom to do that. We don't know what, what the future may bring, but we all need to realize the way to get to heaven is through Him. We have to accept Him as our Savior and Lord. Somebody will stand up. Hey, my, my testimony is pretty tight. Although from the time I was five till I was about 20, I experienced what it was like to get shot. I experienced what it was like to be stabbed. And uh, I've had wrecks that left scars all over me. And <clears throat> Brother Nick Goodnight, was a pastor here in the old church, mm -hmm. and uh, I was saved, uh, but I was about 24 years old, or maybe younger, I don't remember, it was before I met Jolene and Larry Hutter, probably 70, 71, 72. <laughs> Our church didn't have a baptistry, mm -hmm. so I was taken over to McMahon. Not the new building, but the one that sat behind it, which was an old schoolhouse that converted into a church. And they had a baptistry there, and I baptized there. Since then, I've tried to do what I could in the community and this church. Uh, it, was, it was that same year this building burnt down. I think it was 72. And out of those ashes came this building. And you know, when we got through building it, there wasn't a penny owed on it. Yes, and Mrs. Fogel gave us our property over there, and we built the uh, parsonage on it. And if I remember correctly, when we got through a hit, there wasn't no money owed on it. But my mom and dad did go to church and take me every once in a while, not too often. And But I had an uncle, Billy Alexander. He would come by, this was when we were in Houston, and take me to Bible school and Sunday school and vacation Bible school. And he painted the seed. And now I'm 75. I don't get around as good as I would like. I, uh, I love this church, not necessarily the building. I look forward to when we build a church that's even bigger. And God bless all of y'all. And that's kind of my story. I did meet Jo Lynn. She was from down in Spring Perry. Uh, and we married in 72, 50-something years ago. And... I always scared her mom that I stole her off her mom's lap. <laughs> she only married you because of me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thankful. Very thankful. I'd like to be thankful for anybody. Yes, I want to say something. I'm not going to give my testimony so much, except I just want to tell you something. This is better than that food out there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is our food for the soul. You want it? <clears throat> my testimony is that I know that God has always had a plan for me. I can see it because my biological mother gave me to my dad to raise. We moved out here to the country. God's always had a plan because he found my real mom <laughs> who raised and loved me. Amen. And there was never one time that if I went out on Saturday, we had to be in church on Sunday. I was not one of those that never not knew God. And I was baptized in this church. I was brought up in this church. And I, at times, yes, I strayed away. 
way, but I've known in my heart that what I was doing was not right, and prayed to God, and He brought me back. He was always there for me. He's, he's never left me. And my mind's pretty tame. I've had it a few times <laughs> to make it out. I had a really bad break one time from drinking and driving, and those are kind of my times that I've strayed, but I've always, he's always been there, and he's always had a plan, and I've, I've been blessed. Not because you wouldn't let Dad take you home. <laughs> yeah, I didn't listen to him that night either. He was just trying to tell me, but I wouldn't tell you. All right, we're going to forego the invitation today because I think everybody in here knows the Lord except maybe a couple of these children. But I think that if we'll all share our testimony to anybody, anybody we come in contact with, we can see more people get saved and come to know the Lord. So I'm going to close this for the word of prayer. I'm going to go ahead and bless the food. If you do want to come talk to me about how to be saved, you just go ahead and come. We don't have to have an invitation. That invitation is open any time. That's what I'm here for. But let's go to the Lord now. Father, thank you for these that are here this morning, Lord, whether they gave a testimony or not. Thank you for every soul that's in